us the story of the world and of our lives. Sometimes that history goes bump in the night. Broadcasting from the center of oddity and the supernatural in Central Florida, it's the History Goes Bump podcast. Hello, you spooktacular people. Welcome to this seventh episode of the History Goes Bump podcast. Ghost tours for the theater of the mind. I am your host, Diane. And this is Denise. And we want to thank you for joining us on the show. Today's show, we are focusing on the Velisca Axe Murder House. And we want to thank Aaron for suggesting today's show topic. This is going to be a tale that's not only about a haunted location, but it's true crime and an unsolved mystery. And some of the material this evening, of course, is going to be a little graphic in nature due to the subject matter. So we just want to let people know that ahead of time. If you'd like to find out more about the History Goes Bump podcast, we invite you to check out our website at historygoesbump.com. You can find our blog there our Emporium, and the various locations where you can listen to the show. Also, we'd love to get your feedback on the show. If you have different locations you'd like to suggest to us, suggestions about the show, or you just want to add to our commentary, you're more than welcome to do that. You can email us at historyghostbump at gmail.com. Also, we wanted to let everybody know before we get into the heart of the show. When you watch a television show, it always starts with something called a pilot. And anybody who's watched a pilot for a show knows As a show goes on, especially if it gets picked up for years and years and years, the show changes over time, characters grow, that kind of thing. Well, it's kind of the same thing when it comes to radio shows and podcasts. They're going to change over time. We'll figure out what works, what doesn't work. And a big change that we're going to make here at HistoryGhostBump.com is this whole spooktacular crew thing. I wrote a blog, and I would invite all of you to check it out at HistoryGhostBump.blogspot.com. Just kind of giving an update on the show. What it had been is that you had to donate at least $5 every month in order to be a part of the spooktacular crew, and you'd get exclusive content. And we just got to thinking... We didn't like that whole idea. So our big change and announcement is that the Spooktacular crew is now open to everyone. This means that everybody will have access to bonus content, and that content includes not only a newsletter, but also access to the HGB bonus cast. What is the HGB bonus cast, you ask? The HGB bonus cast is the History Goes Bump bonus cast. We just like to use letters. This podcast is different than the regular podcast because it contains bonus material such as outtakes, bloopers, extended interviews, and real life ghost experiences as told by listeners. What we're planning is between one or two of these extra podcasts a month in addition to the regular show, and they will be uploaded to the regular podcast feed, so you'll be able to find them easily. We're also going to be adding video content And if you do check out our Spooktacular Crew tab at the historyghostbump.com website, you'll see all the details on what rewards will be offered if you do have a monetary donation. And also we have different levels that if we hit them, we'll start doing extra things here on the show that we've talked about in the past, like contests. Also, we're thinking about doing documentaries. So those all come when we hit different levels. To become a member of the Spooktacular Crew, you need to do one thing, support the show. And how do you support the show? Easy. You just like the Facebook page, follow us on Twitter, share the podcast on your social media, write for the newsletter, send us feedback, sign up for the newsletter, or hang out with us at meetups and conventions. Of course, monetary help is always appreciated to help us with the expenses of hosting the podcast and the website. And so if you have the means, you can donate to the show with either a one-time donation or set up a monthly donation or purchase something from the Emporium. And of course, we know a lot of you don't have the means to financially support the show. Your listenership is appreciated no matter what. Welcome to this moment in Oddity History. Today's moment in Oddity, fecal transplants. There's a deadly superbug by the name of Clostridium difficile, or C. difficile. The infection causes cramps, fever, diarrhea, and swelling of the bowel. It kills 14,000 Americans a year and has infected up to 500,000 people. A doctor in the UK discovered a way to treat the disease and the treatment is quite odd and a tad disgusting. The treatment is a fecal transplant. That's right, poo is the cure. Stool banks like Open Biome of Massachusetts ask healthy people to donate their stool 
paying them $40 per deposit, and that stool is then used to treat C. difficile. The transplant is performed via a duodenal tube, a rectal tube, or colonoscopy. The healthy stool contains beneficial gut microorganisms, and it fills up the unhealthy intestines of the sick patient with healthy flora. The C. difficile is overwhelmed. The patient is healed. Sending bacteria to fight bacteria makes sense, but it's rather disgusting and, well, odd. Turn out the lights. The party's just getting started. This Day in History On this day in 1873, a revolutionary new form of fencing is registered with the patent office by a farmer named Joseph Glidden. Glidden had gotten the idea for his design after seeing a similar form of fencing made by Henry Rose. The fencing was barbed wire. Rose's version was single-strand while Glidden's was double-stranded and the improvement was significant. The wire was more easily produced and resulted in 80 million tons being produced in 1880. Glidden's wire was the most popular in the nation. Before Glidden's bobbed wire, farmers had to use expensive wood to build fences when trees were unavailable, and his invention made fencing building easy, cheap, and durable. Life on the plains changed drastically. Farmers could protect their land from open-range animals like cattle, and cattle ranchers had to change their operations. No longer could cattle graze openly, but cattle drives could no longer run over unfenced land to rail depots. In later history, barbed wire was used extensively during World War I to protect trenches, and the wire is also used to keep prisoners inside jails. Joseph Glidden probably had no idea just how useful his barbed wire would eventually become. You're listening to History Goes Bump. The subject of today's podcast is far more than just a haunted historic location. The story of this old white farmhouse in the field in Villisca, Iowa, is at the heart of an unsolved true crime that is tragic in every sense of the word. An entire family, along with two other children, lost their lives in one evening. We invite you to take a trip with us back to 1912, back to a small flourishing rural town in Iowa. The town of Villisca is in Montgomery County in Iowa. Today, the city has few residents, but Villisca was a town with a bustling train depot in the early 1900s. D.N. Smith had planned a rail line for the Burlington and Missouri Railroad in 1859 that led to the creation of the town. The Civil War slowed down the building of the railway, but when it was finally built, the depot made the city a center for business and shops began to line the main street. In 1912, Villisca had the only publicly funded armory in the state of Iowa, lending to a rich military history up through the World Wars. The name Villisca means pleasant place, and it was a nice small town where neighbors all knew each other and Sunday socials were important events. Some claim that the town was actually named for the Native American term Willisca, which means evil place. And after hearing the tale that has made Villisca famous, listeners might agree that Willisca fits better. Kind of interesting that those two words are so closely related with just the W and the V being different. Willisca, Villisca. It makes me think that maybe the early founders, going with the Native American, that it's evil place, that the early founders heard Willisca and spelled it in the common German spelling where they flipped the W's and V's. Um, Just a side thought. I don't know if it has any real meaning. That's a good point, Denise. Josiah B. Moore and Sarah Montgomery were married on December 6, 1899, at the home of Sarah's parents. Josiah had lived in Villisca for several years, and he and Sarah settled there. They were well-known, well-liked, and affluent members of the city, and Sarah was very involved with the Presbyterian Church there. They lived on their farm with their four children, 11-year-old Herman Montgomery, 10-year-old Mary Catherine, 7-year-old Arthur Boyd, and five-year-old Paul Vernon. On the morning of June 9th, Josiah Moore phoned the home of Joseph and Sarah Stillinger to inquire if their daughters, Lena and Ina, could come to stay the night that evening at the request of his daughter, Catherine. The Stillinger girls left for church that morning and met up with the Moore family at the annual Children's Day program at the Presbyterian Church. The Stillinger girls and the Moore children all participated in the program that was directed by Sarah Moore, and we imagine that everyone had a grand time. We envision the Moore family at home sharing tales of the day's events and laughing heartily as they set up an area for the Stillinger girls to sleep that evening when they returned a little before 10 p.m. 
No one had a clue what evil was lurking near or in the home. By morning, the entire Moore family and the two Stillinger girls would be dead in a crime that would horrify the nation. Mary Peckman was a good neighbor. Like every good neighbor, she watched over the Moore family. We've had our neighbor personally come across the street and tell us that our garage door was left open because good neighbors do things like that. Mary was gathering up her laundry when she noticed how still the Moore home was, and she could see that no one was working on the chores of the day like milking the cows. She became curious and approached the door and knocked. No one answered. She tried to open the door, but found it locked. She returned home and telephoned Josiah's brother, Ross, who hurried to the homestead. Ross Moore glanced through a window and knocked on the door. He fumbled with his keys and found the one that fit the lock of his brother's door. He opened the door to the downstairs bedroom and immediately returned to the porch, greatly troubled by the brief vision he had of the room. There were two small bodies in the bed, and dark blood was soaked into everything. Mrs. Peckman called the sheriff, and City Marshal Hank Horton was first on the scene. He'd been the primary peace officer for the town for only a year. He found everyone dead where they slept, all having suffered multiple blows to the head. Dark material covered the mirror in the room where the Stillinger girl slept, and an axe rested against a wall. It had been wiped clean. The family's doctor was called to the scene as well as the county coroner. While trying to identify the two girls in the downstairs bedroom, they determined that one of the Stillinger girls appeared to have been molested. Identification was impossible because of the damage to the skulls, but a nearby Bible revealed the girl's identity. It was determined that the axe that was found in the house was the murder weapon, and based on the marks made by the sharp end of the axe on the ceiling in several places, it was hypothesized that the dull side of the axe was the weapon. As detailed in the book, On the Road to Villisca, The Hunt for the Midwest Axeman, by Hank Brewster, axe murders during these years in America's history were not entirely unusual. A family of four was murdered in Portland, Oregon, The Coble couple was murdered in Washington State, and six were murdered in Colorado Springs, to name a few. And who of those can forget Lizzie Borden, who was acquitted in 1892 of the axe murder of her parents? Solving crimes at this time was tough, especially in a small town where police had no real experience with processing crime scenes. There was no DNA analysis until recent history, and fingerprint evidence was just getting its start. It was possible that nearly 100 people tramped through the murder scene, Many just curious townspeople. Could you imagine? I can't imagine if I'd heard there was a murder, especially involving children, that I would want to be anywhere near seeing that horrific scene. People are weird. Well, Denise, I actually heard that there was one of the townspeople had taken part of Josiah's skull as a trophy. And we think that that things have gone awry today. It looks like that we've always had a deviance in the human nature way, way back. Yeah, I mean, I guess it's kind of that whole when we go past a accident that we see on the road and we got to just stop and see the train wreck kind of thing. But yeah, I can't imagine if somebody had killed our neighbors, you know, next to us or across the street. The only reason I would ever go into that scene was if I was checking on them and discovered it that way. And I certainly wouldn't be standing there like gawking or taking pictures. Oh, absolutely not. Or if I heard them screaming for help, I'd be right in the middle of that because I'm not real smart about not getting in the middle of dangerous situations. <laughs> the main evidence that was left behind at the scene was a slab of raw bacon wrapped in cloth that was found near the axe. And some people may wonder, why is this evidence or what in the world was that doing there? Um, I don't want to get into the details of it, but this appears to have been maybe partially a sex type crime. And I'll just leave it to the listener's imagination what you could do with a slab of raw bacon. Uh, Food was prepared and left uneaten on the kitchen table, along with a bowl of bloody water, so apparently the killer washed his hands there. The killer had wiped his hands on several items, and a heel mark was left on a magazine. The police were perplexed as to how one killer could have dispatched the entire family without waking anyone. The victims all had coverings placed over their heads after they were killed, so it was surmised that the killer knew his victims or this was some kind of a ritual. Several people became suspects in the crime, though no one would ever pay for these murders. Frank Jones had once been Josiah's employer. The two men had parted ways on bad terms after nine years, and when Josiah opened up a rival company, taking business from Jones, the bitter rivalry grew. Jones had money, enough to hire someone to do some killing for him, and that led to a second suspect, William Mansfield, an alleged serial killer. 
Two years after the Velisca murders, Mansfield killed his wife, infant child, father-in-law, and mother-in-law in Blue Island, Illinois, with an axe. And before the Velisca murders, he is believed to have committed the axe murders in Paola, Kansas, and the murders of Jeannie Peterson and Jeannie Miller in Aurora, Colorado. Mansfield was arrested, but later let off when employment records gave him an alibi. Of course, for me, Denise, this gave me a little bit of a chill to hear that he was possibly a suspect in axe murders that took place in Aurora, Colorado, because that happens to be the town that I grew up in. And just hearing that takes me back to the 80s, where we had the Hammerman killings in Aurora. Some listeners in Colorado may recall these from the 80s, where uh, some individual went into a home and killed an entire family almost there was it was a family of four and one of the daughters did survive the attack but he used a hammer in order to kill the families and it was kind of like um how this killer used the butt end of the axe uh, the hammer man used the butt end of the hammer as well instead of the part that you usually use to hammer in the nails and for years i remember us you know having nightmares about the hammer man people talking about the hammer man we talked in our last podcast about urban legends and the hammer man basically has become an urban legend that started off of a true story. Reverend George Kelly was also considered a suspect. The good reverend was a traveling preacher who was in town for the Presbyterian Church's Children's Day and left quickly the following morning, which is why he was under suspicion. When he was brought in, he confessed to the crime after coercion, and the confession was thrown out before he was tried. An initial trial ended with a hung jury, and he was acquitted during the second trial. That's really odd. I wonder why, even under coercion, why you would ever confess to that. I don't know all the specific details. For people who are interested in this story, there's been several books written on it, and they go into great details about the trials and the suspects. And... I just imagine that if you have somebody who's sitting there long enough in a room and you're pressuring them enough, it it has even happened in modern times, people eventually end up confessing so that they'll just be left alone. Another serial killer was suspected of being at work. Earlier, we mentioned the book about the Midwest Axemen. Henry Lee Moore was believed to be that man, and he was convicted of the murders of his mother and grandmother after the Velisca murders occurred. They were killed like the Moore family. Henry Lee Moore is a study all to himself and an infamous killer. And just for those who might be wondering, even though he does have the last name Moore, he was not related to the Velisca family. Andy Sawyer was a drifter and he claimed that he passed through Villisca at the same time the murders occurred. He was never arrested because a sheriff in a nearby town had arrested Sawyer for vagrancy the night of the murders. That's one time when you're really glad that you got picked up, right? No kidding. So, who murdered the family? We will never know, and perhaps that is why the Moore home is believed to be one of the most haunted locations in America. The home has gone through eight owners since the Moors were murdered. Darwin and Martha Lynn brought the home finally in 1994 and restored it to the way it had been when the Moore family lived there. The home is on the National Register of Historic Places and is open for tours and overnight paranormal investigations. Tours and overnights have yielded claims of unexplained occurrences from children's disembodied voices to objects falling over to oil lamps blowing out and people being touched. The woman who suggested this location to us has stayed overnight in the home, and she not only expressed having feelings of sadness, but she also heard scratching on the walls and something touched her husband's ear, waking him from sleep. Their fully charged lights flickered, and an interesting point she expressed to us was the absence of bugs both outside and inside the house, during the summer in Iowa. And someday when we're having dinner with this person, I'm going to have to say, what, are you crazy? I would no longer be sleeping in that house if anything had touched me. <laughs> well, and they really tempted fate because what she and her husband did is they laid in the bedroom of the more patriarch and his wife in the exact same positions, and right above her husband's head was indeed one of those axe marks on the ceiling. Wow. I don't know if that's bravery or slight insanity. No offense, but I there's no way. So moving on, well-known paranormal investigator Troy Taylor investigated the house in 2005, and he and his team documented the closing of a door several times when candy was offered as enticement. They tried to debunk the movement of the door in every way and found no explanation. The website Haunting Velisca has the following testimonial. On April 29, 2006, four members of PRISM, Paranormal Research and Investigative Studies Midwest, 
and three guest investigators spent the night in the Velisca Axe murder house. The following is an account of some of their experiences. Several times, some of the team members felt their hair being tugged, and one of us felt a tugging on the chain necklace he was wearing. The team was all gathered in the parlor room downstairs, and while there, they heard noises from the upstairs, thuds and bumps like someone was jumping off of the bed or children roughhousing. At about 2.45 a.m., the closet door in the children's room upstairs opened and closed by itself. There was a candy necklace hanging on the closet door handle, and it would move and rattle against the door, and then the door would either open or close. This happened several times and was witnessed by the team and also was caught on film. Also in the bedroom, the women of the team witnessed what appeared to be tiny pale fingers from the inside of the closet door. (laughs) <laughs> waving from underneath the bed and touching the inside of the door. Also witness was an intermittent faint glow coming from the inside of the closet. Throughout the night, the team recorded audio and took many digital pictures. Some EVPs and spirit orbs and spirit anomalies were captured, and some of these can be viewed on www. Do you see deadpeople.org? This is an experience that none of us will soon forget and all look forward to going to the house again. Precisely why we're not paranormal investigators and we just like to find the historic part because I would not be going back to that house again. No how, no way. The strange thing about the hauntings is that no one who lived in the houses prior to the lens purchasing the house ever reported paranormal activity. It seems to have started only after renovations were implemented. And one has to ask the question, how much effect could all these paranormal groups going through the house have had on the house? Have they brought something with them? Have they conjured something? Is the Moore home in Villisca, Iowa haunted? That is for you to decide. And some of you probably have heard of this home because it has been featured all over TV. Various haunted location programs. Also, I know Ghost Hunters has been there and Ghost Adventures has been there as well. So this is a site that has had a lot of traffic going through it. And I always wonder, Denise, spirits can attach to people and possibly we're having who knows what going through that house at this point. Is the family still there because of such a a devastating tragedy? I don't know. And of course, you and I have certain beliefs about children. I, I don't believe any of the children really are there. This is why sometimes it does make you wonder if it's such a good idea to have so much paranormal investigation going on in these locations. I would agree. And sometimes I even wonder if, you know, going back to early on the story that possibly was named after a native word meaning evil place is that that was already there before and so that's what they're getting some now especially again with the children I always think that's masked as something else. That's a great point Denise because we don't know the history of what was on that land before they put the home there you know was this an Indian burial ground is there just you know when we talk about things like the land was bad you might hear people talk about land was cursed. This is actually a biblical principle. And for those of you who remember back to the first murder that the Bible ever talks about when Cain kills his brother Abel, how did God know that Abel had been killed? He heard his blood crying from the ground, from the the cursed ground where he was murdered. And the Bible talks about different areas and land being cursed. So who knows? Was this land somehow cursed in some way? And this is why this happened. It's just you have to to even fathom the kind of evil that has to be within someone to kill people, much less six children, six Mm. innocent children were killed in this heinous act. Now that just makes me sick to my stomach. I just, crimes against children, just, I, I don't even have the words for it. It just puts this deep pit in the pit of my stomach. Well, this show is definitely a kind of downer, but we want to invite you to hang out with us this Halloween. We will be having the History Goes Bump Halloween special where we will be sharing some of your real ghost stories, experiences that you've had And we'll also be talking about the history of Halloween. Yes, and thank you for the people who sent us those stories. It's just reading your stories and getting to know you better that way. Some of the things I didn't know about some of our listeners. So thank you so much for being willing to give us your stories. And as always, if you want to share your stories or give us any feedback, email us at historyghostbump at gmail.com. We want to thank you for being with us. This has been Diane. And Denise. You take care now. Bye-bye. Be sociable, drop the chain rattling, neck biting and shape shifting and join us on Facebook and Twitter at History Goes Bump. Like the page and follow us.